Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about WTF as an audit anyway. Um, I am Sock. I'm one of the co-founders of Code Arena. And Code Arena invented the competitive audit. If you're unfamiliar, uh, in Code Arena, we have top auditors compete to secure your code. We have uh, 5,000 plus auditors. Um, we've performed 280 audits since uh, beginning of 2021. Um, and some of those include Base, Chainlink, ENS, OpenSea, ZK Sync. Uh, in fact, Chainlink right now is running one of uh, their, I think their fourth or so uh, audit competition on our platform. Uh, and it's open, anybody can, can, can jump in and compete, and we tend to have uh, large numbers of participants uh, ranging from 100 to multiple hundreds. Um, this talk is the one that I think that you should share with your business co-founder, because the reality is that most of the time, Security gets seen as something that is not really much of a business uh, uh, topic and kind of this inaccessible thing. And I want to make sure that um, by the time I'm done that you've got a picture that is useful to share with your business co-founder. So again, what is, what, what is an audit anyway? Well, the Latin word of audit, uh, I, I actually was going to use the Webster's Dictionary defines audit as but uh, right in the middle of the word is a nice definition because you have the word hearing from Latin. So go ahead, put my code on trial is basically uh, the idea of an audit. So how do you prepare for your trial is the thing that you really want to be thinking about while you're writing your code gearing up for an audit. And I want to share with you some classic audit prep strategies that you may have seen or may be familiar with. Uh, and some of these come from really the top uh, sort of business mentalities, um, such as security is a developer's responsibility, not the business's. Um, or seeing audit, the audit as marketing, right? That it's really about how we, how we come off looking by this audit. And so that ends up with some strategies uh, from developers, such as, uh, you know, seat of your pants is a very common, uh, common one, or incomplete test coverage. Uh, Ignoring the com creeping complexity as you've sort of continued to build and build and build what you're, uh, what you're doing. We'll, we'll write docs later. Uh, and then, you know, the very common one is just thoughts and prayers going into the audit. Uh, the fact is that most people don't prepare very well for their audits at all. Uh, and that is especially in the smart contract world. And I think in terms of the gravity of what it is that we are doing with this code, uh, security needs to be taken at a much higher level uh, when it comes to an organization as a whole. And the fact is that we see people come through Code Arena all the time, and they finish up an audit with a giant group of auditors tearing, out, tearing apart their code, and they discover that they've got a ton of vulnerabilities, and that, in fact, probably the best thing that they should be doing is rewriting a large amount of it. Well, that just makes me sad because, you know, in some ways, I almost want to say, shut up and keep your money. Because at that point that you're going back and rewriting all of this, you now have, you really ought to be doing another audit. And so uh, that process is pretty painful to see someone spend good money on a high quality audit with a large number of people tearing it apart and then basically need to go back to square one on a huge portion of their code base. Uh, we don't actually say shut up and keep your money. We will take your money. Um, and we'll take your money for the second audit that you need to do because the first audit was uh, revealed a lot of vulnerabilities in what you were doing. But the fact is that an audit starts before you write a line of code. I think a lot of people, the mental model that we have in our heads, especially from a biz business perspective, is armor. In fact, so many, there are so many security products that use armor or some sort of you know, defense shield sort of thing in the name of whatever it is that they're providing. But if your mental model for security, especially in the smart contract domain, is armor, then you need an entirely new mental model. So we're kind of stuck in this world in the sort of post-web approach. Uh, you know, prior to the web, we had a lot more discipline in software development. But the web enabled an enormous amount of flexibility in deployment and in making fixes. And as a result, the general approach that we take is build, then ship, then secure. And people very frequently ship a product, and then they're kind of catching up a little bit behind <laughs> on, on uh, getting things secured. 
but the fact is that stakes in Web3, it may still be web, uh, but the stakes in Web3 are way too high for this. It just isn't a model that will work. And that requires completely rethinking the way that we approach these sorts of projects. An audit starts before you write a line of code. So let's, let's talk about bridges. And no, I actually mean the other kind. Um, so what is the goal of bridge design? Cross the river is the goal of bridge design. But there's sort of maybe a few other goals that are involved when it comes to building a bridge. You're trying to cross the, bri you're trying to cross the river safely, reliably, and durably in all kinds of conditions, accounting for worst case scenarios, and in a scenario where this is going to be unmaintained for long periods of time, very hopefully. It's just gonna be set up there, deployed, and that sounds an awful lot like smart contracts. Secure by design is a model that uh, many people have heard, um, but I wanna talk about just one very, very clear look at a way of thinking about how you can be secure by design from the beginning of your process, even before you start writing a line of code. And I again wanna reiterate something that I sort of alluded to before, which is the value of an audit is actually what the people at the highest level of the organization put into it. Planning, investment, priority, the amount of time that they give to developers, the amount of money that they give to developers to be able to get the access that they need from an education perspective, or from a resourcing perspective, um, to the pressure to ship is so strong from a business perspective. The go-to-market element is so strong that very often security is seen as something that we can just sort of skip over um, or that we can tack on or that we'll get to it as much as we can as we can. And if timelines slip, we've got a deadline and we really still need to ship that and if the audit comes back and it says, this has kind of got a few problems in it, we're gonna need to just patch those as fast as we can and move on. So let's talk about what secure by design means. Secure by design means doing computer science. It means actually doing science, the science part of computer science. Uh, and you know, you're all very familiar with the scientific method create a hypothesis in very basic, you know, simple, simple forms, create a hypothesis, uh, test that hypothesis in some way, and analyze the results. Um, the fact is that you can start auditing your code without an auditor. And in fact, starting from the very beginning with that mentality is what's going to set you up so well for your audit to be able to be something that when you come to the audit, it becomes an education opportunity for you to level up what you're already doing and to identify the things that you can do just a little bit better. So I wanna talk about threat modeling. How many people are familiar with threat modeling? I would guess that many people have heard of the idea of threat modeling, um, but how many people do that as a regular part of whatever process that you're doing? I would imagine that most people might do it a little bit on a casual basis, but the vast majority aren't familiar with it. And I would bet that when it comes to the business side of your organization, that when it comes to the topic of a threat model or building a threat model, that the business folks are not at the table or participating uh, in that thinking. The value of a threat model in large, in large, uh, you know, in, in, in a very, very, very large way is that it also allows you to translate the risk that your application has, that your contracts have, that it trans you can translate that risk into what the business risk is and the business impact of those risks. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways of doing threat modeling and a lot of ways of looking at it. Um, probably the one that I think is most apt uh, in this context is one called uh, PASTA, which is a process of uh, a attack. Uh, I, I just lost my train. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's a process of uh, uh, yeah, you can look it up. <laughs> I forget what PASTA stands for. But the entire idea is it's a process for an, an analyzing uh, attacks. So the one thing that I would say is that there are these processes that you can go through that are very structured in how you do like threat modeling the right way. But <laughs> that's sort of um, the mid-tier approach. Uh, I would just say, just start out by making attack trees. And I'll get into talking about what attack trees are, but I love this quote, defenders think in lists and attackers think in graphs. 
As long as this is true, the attackers win. Because the fact is, at the end of the day, there's more than one way to skin an app. And so building an attack tree is a way of identifying how someone is going to think about attacking your smart contracts, your application. Uh, and so building an attack tree kind of this is the process. Um, it's really kind of brainstorming like a mind map for attackers. So you're actually starting to put your, in, you're, putting your, uh, you're putting your black hat on as you're thinking about what it is that uh, someone's going to want to do. So you're looking first and foremost at one of the attacker's goals. You center in on a specific attacker's goal. Um, and you describe that goal in business terms. And this is where it's very useful to bring, particularly in the earliest phases of threat modeling, to be able to bring in what, what are the business perspectives that you're trying to protect. Obviously, everyone in the business is going to understand the risk of stealing user funds. But there are plenty of other things that happen that may not necessarily be you know, as clearly uh, you know, uh, a risk to the business. Um, and that's where it can be extremely valuable to be bringing in. And also, there's to be bringing in business people. And also, there are things that business folks see that may not necessarily be um, present in the minds of uh, developers as they're building. So you describe, you describe the attacker's goal in business terms. Um, you identify high-level methods that an attacker might use to reach the goal. And hand-wavy is good at the top. It's actually very good because part of the benefit of that is it allows you to put things in terms that business folks on your team are going to understand. So that as you're drilling down deeper in layers that are going to be more detailed, that there is a parent at some level up the attack tree that they will absolutely understand. So thinking about that center point as the goal the attacker is looking at and the various methods as sort of the next layer from that point on, you're starting to think about the different ways they could attempt that method. Um, so you, what, if you're looking at a, a dependency exploit, for example, that might be a way that someone could steal user funds, you, you know, it could be an outdated dependency, or it could be a zero day, or it could be a malicious contract. Um, but you start to build this out farther, and you start to identify what are the specific prerequisites and dependency chains for each method. Well, I did promise that this was going to be like a business-friendly sort of talk, and that may be like even a little bit more, uh, you know, a little too technical from an example perspective. So I'm going to give the Kendall Roy attack tree. Um, this is for anybody who's seen is seen Succession. Uh, this will make sense to you. If you haven't seen Succession, it'll still make sense. But if you haven't, definitely spoilers. So, uh, so here's Kendall Roy's CEO attack tree. So at the very top, what is Kendall's goal? Is to become the CEO. Uh, get rid of his dad. He wants to be the CEO. Um, so when we think about his attack tree, dad voluntarily decides to retire. OK, what, what needs to happen there? Well, dad needs to get old. Uh, also, as a dependency, I need to impress the board members. I need to say fuck a lot, probably to impress the board members. Uh, entrench myself in day-to-day -day operations in advance. Uh, work faithfully in dad's business. And before that, something, something nepotism, right? So, this is very kind of the happy path of like, oh, this is kind of where things start out. And then it's like, well, he's got to take other routes to try to get into this position because the first route didn't quite turn out the way that he hoped, hoped it would. So, well, hey, uh, let's go this other route. We'll get the board to vote to force dad out uh, and, and force him to retire and name me. Uh, so we've got to get a majority of the board on, on, on board. Uh, so I'll lobby the board members uh, to support a transition. Uh, I got to impress the board members in order to do that. I got to say fuck a lot. Something tempting nepotism to be in the position to do that. Uh, but I can't. It's not just impressing the board members. And I, in order to lobby them, I've also got to do something else. So we've got multiple dependencies here, right? So uh, also we need dad to have a stroke. We need dad to get old in order to do that. So uh, then we can go. All right. Well, that that route didn't didn't end up working out the way that I thought it would. So uh, we'll get the shareholders to pressure the board. And then maybe I can uh, have the board vote to uh, get dad to retire and name me. Uh, so what's a way that I could do that? Well, let's openly scandalize dad with dirty laundry. Well, I need to get some dirty laundry from someone. Oh, I'll find an ingratiating cousin uh, with some explosive intel. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to do more than just pressure the board. There's also got to be, I, I got to figure out some way that the family loses 
control of the, uh, pr the dominating stake in the business. So I uh, got a deal compromising families con the family controlling equity uh, and uh, I'll become the interim CEO while dad's sick and then I'll be able to in invoke that deal. Uh, I got to impress the board members and say fuck a lot, of course, and something, something nepotism to do that too. Uh, well, okay, that didn't work. Well, I'll try hostile takeover, or uh, I'll get back on dad's good side, and in order to do that, I'll fully debase myself in pursuit of power at all costs. Um, but, okay, that didn't work out. Okay, so well, what if there was an outdated and mostly illegible will that seemed to imply that at one point before I ruthlessly backstabbed him multiple times, the dad's dying wish was for me to become the CEO, right? So there's like all kinds of ways to do this. Anyway, this is your moment. If you've ever wanted to do one of these. Uh, this is basically attack trees. Um, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. As long as this is true, attackers win. So if you're just thinking like, all right, well, I got a you know, rancher C. You know, I'm checking out on my rancher C's. I'm, I'm good there. Um, uh, you've you, you got to go a little farther. Uh, an attack tree informs your armor? No, it informs your architecture, it informs your mechanism, it informs your processes, it informs your business priorities, it informs everything. Once you have an attack tree, then you can start to identify where you can block attack paths, right? As you see those moves up the chain, you can see, well, you know, if we can cut this one off here, then we reduce that. And you can figure out where do you want to add in um, fail safes and circuit breakers that in the event that this, this incident were to take place, what could we do in order to reduce the impact of this taking place, right? So you've got multiple layers of thinking in terms of your overall defense against this graph attack. Now, I did say that you could just make attack trees, but the reality is some of these steps are really useful, especially as you start to build this out in more detail. Really, really digging into um, some of the finer points of this, because the fact is that your, uh, your, attack, your attack tree is going to get a bit wild. Um, but the fact is, it's better to know it and see it in front of you than it is to have it be completely blind to you. So it's going to get wild. But you know what else is going to happen is you're going to miss things. You absolutely will miss things. But so do good auditors. There's this quote from uh, Nassim Taleb where he talks about uh, the process of writing a book. By the way, uh, you know, Nassim Taleb, don't ask him his opinions on crypto. But um, you give, he says, you know, give a text to a copy editor. They'll make three changes per page. Then you accept it, and then you give it to another, and they will still get three changes per page, and so on. That essentially, everybody, everybody who's doing work of reviewing something like that has in their head a standard number of things that they're going to make a change to or bring in their feedback on. And in reality, this happens with auditors as well. This is both, this is both a good thing and it's a challenging thing, that everybody is going to be in pursuit of a certain number of bugs. They sort of have a feel as they're auditing of like, this is, you know, I feel like I've looked at this enough. I feel like I've identified enough high severity vulnerabilities that, you know, it's probably I've, I've made my case that this isn't quite secure yet. Um, but the other piece is that, uh, you know, you sort of have that, you sort of have that limitation um, that's there. And that's where, and, and you, when you are looking at your own attack trees, you're going to experience the same sort of wall where you're going to be like, okay, this is getting a little bit difficult. And at that point, the fact is that fresh eyes are gold. So I want to go to a question that I see happen a lot of times in our industry, which is most firms, most uh, rather most uh, uh, most smart contract uh, uh, projects get multiple audits. Why do they get multiple audits? Well, the stakes are millions. Four tired eyes are not enough. Um, but also, it's not just about that. It's also the different auditors have unique approaches and philosophies an enormous value in the process of auditing is that diversity of perspective. Um, what does uh, competitive Magic the Gathering have to do with smart contract auditing? I saw this, uh, I, I saw this discussion took, take place among a uh, handful of auditors at one point where um, there was a, a recognition that they all had played competitive Magic the Gathering. And the, the fact is that uh, some of the most honorary smart contract vulnerabilities are not from really clearly categorizable bugs, 
but are in fact from invalid assumptions in mechanism design. And so when you're thinking about people who play competitive Magic the Gathering, my brother-in-law plays competitive Magic the Gathering, and it, when I've played Magic against him, the thing I realize is he's figured out how to game the stupid system. Now, if he goes plays competitive Magic the Gathering, they're like, you cannot use this card, you can't do this in this combination, you can't have more than X number of these in your deck, because I'll sit down and play with him, and it's like, nope, game over. Like, he, he pulled three cards that he needed, and that's it. Like, I don't even get a move again. Um, that's it. I'm dead. And uh, smart contracts are the same way. People looking for holes in that mechanism design, and of course, mechanism design has an awful lot to do has a lot awful lot to do with uh, game design, right? So that diversity of perspective brings an enormous amount of value. There's some really cool people that um, I've had the chance to get to know in the Coderina community of auditors, uh, Trust, uh, OX52, sorry not sorry, Chris Apostolov. Uh, Trust is a hardware uh, engineer. And he's coming at smart contra contract development from the hardware perspective. OX52 had never done de development at all prior to joining and has become one of the most uh, powerful and authoritative um, uh, finders of bugs out there. I mean, just absolutely decimating the competition. Sorry Not Sorry is literally has been a ship captain, but has become an outstanding auditor and, and had never written code prior to becoming an auditor. And then you've got uh, people like uh, Chris Apostolov. Uh, I love this, this interaction that happened. Uh, Gogo -Go the auditor says, uh, auditor, auditing is sometimes so strange. You work with several audit firms, you pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for services, they spend tens of human weeks inspecting every single line of code, and then some anonymous kid comes, looks at your code base one night and spots a bug, a high severity issue, that everyone else missed. And Chris says, who's 16 years old, uh, says uh, that's because the auditors didn't have gummy bears while auditing. <laughs> um, and so Coderina's approach is like, we ask, well, why not multiple audits from multiple perspectives and multiple philosophies all at the same time? Um, and that is one of the you know, things that we feel like our industry needs as a way of approaching audits. But really, it comes back to the idea that fresh eyes are gold. Your attack trees. They may, get, they may get wild. In fact, they're going to get wild. And it's going to get really frustrating and complex, and it's going to feel like you're just looking at a giant mess uh, at some point. And I'm sorry that this is hard. <laughs> um, it, just, it just is hard. Uh, but you know what else is hard is hardware. Um, and I think this is something that we can think more in our industry as we make transitions and thinking about how we look at the future Thinking in terms of hardware is actually maybe more useful than thinking in the past precedent of software. So Panic is a software company. I don't know if, how many of you have ever seen this, this product. Panic is a software company um, that makes a little device. Uh, they, but they were a Mac software company for a very long time. But they, make, they made a device uh, called Playdate that is basically a small game, uh, game console. Um, and uh, so Stephen Frank, they basically started this process. It took about 10 years to get through you know, from a concept that they originally wanted to make as kind of a thank you gift to their most valued customers. They just wanted to do this as a fun thing. Um, but they kept kind of working on this. And, and uh, so Stephen Frank, one of the co-founders, said, hardware is hard. Maybe that's why they call it that. And you know, the fact is it's sort of smart contracts. It's a fantastic podcast that they put together telling the story of this. But one of the things that I love that you get to see as part of this is you get to see that when this software company that had really not ever done hardware, when they encounter hardware, all of the challenges and problems that they see that are now totally, totally new. Um, so they go through the process of telling that story um, in, this, in this podcast. But one of the things that they say is, you know, when you're building hardware, you no longer have control over it. And that's scary. It sounds exactly like smart contracts, right? And so you have that line, hardware is hard. Maybe that's why they call it that. But they bring in this uh, consultant who's done an enormous number of hardware projects, and he has this, uh, he has this line that he says, hardware is hard, but it's not impossible. Uh, and they talk about the, so Greg Miletic, their, their uh, product manager says, you know, it's a big learning curve, because we've never done hardware QA before. We know a lot about software QA, but doing it on hardware is a totally different thing. So you have all these stations built up so you can test different aspects, and, 
And uh, you know, that, that approach was just totally, completely new to them. Um, hardware is hard. It's not impossible. Uh, I love this line from uh, Watchpug, who's uh, uh, an auditor who's competed on, competed on Coderina. Uh, the E in Solidity stands for easy, which I will correct appropriately for the E in Cairo uh, stands for easy. Um, and the fact is that this is, this is hard. Uh, but an audit starts, again, before you write a line of code. So do computer science. Start with and think about your actual risks of your application, theorize about them, and use the audit as a way of improving your thinking, improving your theory about how you can properly protect your application. Uh, it is hard. But I do love the Playdate doctrine of smart contract development, um, which I totally just made up which is be at least as diligent as a software company building a hardware side project for fun. Um, and you go through and listen to that story, and that is absolutely what they did, and spent an enormous amount of time learning and understanding how to do it well, uh, and how to do it in a way that totally challenged their thinking coming from a software perspective. So be at least as diligent as a software company building a hardware side project for fun. Uh, thank you, and uh, appreciate your time and hope you have a great day.